this computer. Hello, Colin. Hi, how are you doing? All right, thank you. Thank you for this talk. Um, so this is Colin Morpeth. I'm Jackie White, Inspirations Positive Living. Uh, and Colin came to my awareness probably only about three months ago because you went on some sort of course with Paul Leclerc. You did his course. And while you were doing that, you were drawing these amazing, or you drew an amazing picture that picked up the energy of the day. You're probably yeah, going to show us that. Yeah. So, yeah. so Paul had told me all about you, but I hadn't met you. And then we go up the hill in Lindhurst on a Sunday and you were up there one day. But then I heard that you'd had this awful accident about a year ago, which you're going to tell us about. And that you that you'd had 122 broken bones only a year ago. Um, and then it turns out that your mum, obviously, I know your mum very well because Diane used to come along to my Inspirations Positive Living Group um, in Southampton very regularly. Uh, so I know your mum very well. And um, it's lovely to meet you. So I've been chatting with you a bit now. But yeah, I would love to know the story. I don't really know the story of all what's happened, but I do know that it's an absolute miracle that you're as fit and healthy as you are now. So, yeah, do you want us to? Yeah, you wherever to you want to start, Colin. So I've sort of thought about this all week, really. So I'll give a brief description. Before the accident, I was self-employed. I run my own custom car business, building camper vans, custom motorbikes, stuff like that. Um, and when you work for yourself, you're never off, are you? You you always seem to be at work. You know, I had half a dozen staff. Um, so anyhow, so what it is, I decided to wind my own business down and start looking for just normal employment. Um, and I say this at the time because... I'd say I was in a little bit of a hole, let's just say mentally, like, you know, not feeling so good. I'd not long finished with a long-term girlfriend um, I had a little girl with. Uh, so, yeah, when you just think you turn in the corner, it's like life just keeps, you know, have another little hit, have another little hit, have another little hit. So I'd actually got a new job uh, building yachts or one of my other trades is I'm a yacht builder. Um, so I... Before the accident, the day I had the accident, I was meant to go for an interview. But ironically, last week was the anniversary of the accident. And it was on the same day I had the same interviews. So it's weird how exactly a year down the line, I've had the same interviews for the same company, exactly to the day. Like, which is spooky, coincidental, call it what you will. So... Uh, when I went on the Wednesday night, on Wednesday the 9th of November, um, with both my boys, so I've got a 22-year-old son and a 19-year-old son, and we used to go to, for local people, we'll go down to Wexbury Gardens, which is next to Bewley, so we'll go down to the local snooker hall and just play snooker. Um, I had like half a beer at the start of the night when I got there at 6 o'clock. We left the pub, at, so we know this now because obviously the... The police interviewed the bar staff and stuff. So we left the pub at about six minutes past 10. And at 12 minutes past 10, I aquaplaned on some water at 42 mile an hour, just going through the forest. So the car just picked up. It's actually on CCTV from a local resident's house. The car just starts to turn. And I think what happened, where I've been a driver all my life and a like road motorbikes. My one of my last flashback memories is shouting at the boys were crashing. So in my head as a father, I remember thinking I'm not letting them hit first. So I've got big scars. I've got huge metal plates running down here, like pins across big plates in both my wrists. Because what I think I've done is I tried to wrestle the car. So as I've tried to wrestle the car, I've managed to turn the car and that's what caused the amount of damage to me. So that's why both my boys survived. So the engine actually come through the footwell of the car on my side and with that, I don't want to 
go into too much graphic detail for those who were a bit squeamish, but it basically cut my legs off. So my left leg was actually hanging off. And when I say hanging off, I mean like literally hanging on. The only reason why they reckon it stayed on was because of my jeans, because I had just jeans on. Um, so I have a flashback of when we hit the trees and then I woke up a good few minutes later. But what has happened, when we hit the trees, the car went sideways, so we all went forward and then went sideways. The seatbelt come out, wrapped around my neck and was actually hanging me. So one of the people that first stopped, um, they then ran back to a local house and I just met the kid last week um, and I just cuddled him. I had a cry with him um, because if it wasn't for him cutting that seatbelt, I would have never survived the crash anyway. So irrelevant of what happened to the rest of my body, the first challenge was actually getting the seatbelt off us. So they cut the seatbelt and then I fell back in the car. I have a weird flashback of trying to teach people CPR. So I've been a childcare worker for 15 years of my life. Um, I know like advanced first aid and the paramedics were laughing because even though I was dying, I was still trying to teach the guys that pulled up at the scene how to do CPR on us. And that's my last memory. And then I woke up six weeks later out of a coma. So looking at your legs, you know, with frames on them, cages, trying to send that signal. So we all naturally walk. When you walk, you don't think about putting one foot in front of the other. But when you look at your legs and you try to move them and nothing happens, it was honestly probably one of the scariest moments of my life. Like, obviously, and to be told, I'll not walk for a year. I'll not eat because I've got scars absolutely everywhere. I broke my face. Um, they were feeding us through my ear and through a tube in my nose because I couldn't actually swallow food. Um, I've lost a few teeth. I broke my face. Um, so, yeah, so I, I woke up six weeks later in, in a daze. Um, and I, I suppose I'll say this because I think it's quite important. Um, my body might have been in the hospital, but my mind wasn't. So where I've had complex PTSD, they, I keep having obviously flashbacks of the accident, um, shouting at the kids. Like say my last memory is being hung out of a car, hanging myself with the seatbelt um, and just shouting at the kids to the point I actually nearly lost my voice because I was shouting so hard at them. And, and as well, when the paramedics turned up, so... I hold a bit of a record. So for one car accident, Hampshire Air Ambulance turned up, Devon and Cornwall Air Ambulance turned up. I think it's eight fire engines and about 10 police cars. Um, so my youngest son got cut out the car first. My oldest son got cut out the car second. And then it took about four to five hours to cut me out of the car. So I clinically died at the scene. I found out for four minutes. Um, so they obviously had to bring me back to life. Um, so these are the little bits I'll digress in. So when I was in my coma, I kept getting flashbacks and dreams. And one very specific flashback is that when the car crashed, I still say it was my soul, like something come out of me and raised above the car because I could see the whole crash. I could see myself. I could see the boys. I could see my camera, my laptop, the stuff that was in the car. I could see the police. And that was just a thought. I hadn't seen any photos, spoke to anyone about this image I had in my head. So obviously, with it being a police uh, uh, crash, I got interviewed by the police. Um, and they showed me a photo. And in the interview... I literally collapsed because the photo they showed me was exactly, I can't stress this enough, was exactly the same as the image I had in my head. So that's when I really started to question what's real and what's not. Do you know what I mean? Like the power of thought, the power of belief. Um, so, yeah, I... 
then that it actually put us back a little bit, you know, with thoughts, PTSD, flashbacks, stuff like that. I was still in a wheelchair. I had the big air casts on at the time, splints on my wrists. Um, and I think when I got home, I just remember thinking I've got two options because I felt pretty low. I feel really guilty that I'd hurt my children, even though it was an accident. Do you know what I mean? Like proven accident. You know, there was no drink or anything involved. I don't, I'm not a drinker. I literally genuinely had half a beer at the start of the night. I just, I then questioned everything. Yeah. My own existence, my kids. And I think what the hard thing for me was, was working out what was actually in this world compared to where I was dreaming all the time in the dream world. Yeah. So I have 28 individual dreams of where they tried to kill us every single night I was in a coma. So that's what I'm saying. I have, I have like what they call complex PTSD. So when they tried to wake us up out of the coma, I was actually trying to, you know, I can't remember none of this, but I was trying to grab the nurses, grab the doctors, because in my dreams, every single night I was in a coma, they were trying to kill me. Oh my God. So when the walk is up, of course, I thought that was still, I thought it was the real world. So I thought the nurses and doctors that were around me were, I can't, I, I really can't stress this enough. I genuinely thought they were trying to kill us. Um, and I suppose this is, I feel like, the right platform to say, you know, I've spoke to lots of people about this, but there's some bits of information I'll hold back because I, I, I think when I've spoke to people that don't believe what I've been through so in my dreams they were actually killing children so it wasn't only me they were trying to kill they were killing children in the hospital birth defects children where they got dumped stuff like that and it was actually a sport to them so they would actually come in with air rifles and kill the, in my dreams though so like say this is in yes, my yes. dreams yes. Um, so I think what was hard when I first come out of the coma is that I thought the dream world I'd been in was reality. Yeah. So for nearly a month after the call, man, all I could think about was screaming children. And I can't stress that enough. Like, and they were getting pilled, killed by the police, the doctors, everything else. So the mental journey for me has been very different to the physical journey. Like, it's it's two very different paths. Um, it's really heavy, eh? Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. If anyone wants to ask any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, so, yeah, so I think when I realised what had gone on, because in my dreams, my boys were in the dreams. Right. So in my world, the boys weren't hurt. So what happened, the nurses and the doctors didn't actually tell me how bad my kids were to start off with because they wanted to try and protect me a little bit, yeah? Um. So I eventually found out what happened to the boys. So my oldest son now suffers from what you call frontal lobe syndrome, where they, they actually drilled his head in four places at the scene of the accident to relieve the blood pressure from his brain. Um, and then I, I regressed again because obviously I then realised what was going on. You know, reality hit. And it's like every day you've just got to... I, I can't just dig deep. I can't stress that enough. Like, I don't actually like saying this, but I was suicidal, very suicidal, Um, where I just felt so guilty, you know, body conscious, where I thought I'd never use my hands again or my legs or anything. So I did go to a dark place, unfortunately, but it was one of those where I had to be really real with myself, as in... I know, I, like again, I, I I can't not but just be honest. It was either do something about it, yeah. or get a grip and carry on. Do you know what I mean? So I love my kids. I would give them my last breath. Um, and when I realised how poorly the kids were, that's when I woke up the next day. Like my hairs are standing up right now. Yeah, mine. And I just thought, I am not ever ever leaving their side again do you know what i mean like 
I need to be there. It doesn't, I don't care. I didn't care about me. I didn't care whether I was in a wheelchair, whether I would walk again. All my concern was was just to see the boys, cuddle them, tell them that I loved them. Um, yeah, and that that's what be started the start of my journey, mm -hmm. for better words, was the reward to recovery wasn't just about me. It was about my children. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. that motivation every day is what I genuinely believe kept me alive. Um, so another thing I have to say is like, like say Jackie, we go on a Sunday we chat a lot of like minded people. I stopped all medication, everything. Mm -hmm. So everything the hospital were offering us, I stopped everything because I don't believe in medication. That's just my personal belief. But I was on blood thinners, mood stabilizers, iron tablets, heart tablets, the injections for the blood thinners are straight into the tops of both your legs five times a day. And it really hurts. Like, I can't stress that enough. It really hurts. So I actually made the decision there and then to stop all medication. And then within about three weeks of actually being out my coma, they were just feeding us. So they were literally just bringing us me dinner. I was hitting all the goals with physio and stuff like that and exercises. Um, and then Christmas Eve, I come home. I come home on Christmas Eve in a wheelchair, still bandaged up, still pretty hurt. But I managed to come home. And so, you know, I believe I've done as much as the recovery process as I did in hospital with help from nurses and doctors and physio. But for me, the journey started when I got home. Do you know what I mean? Like to be in your own space. Honestly, again. I'll just say, Colin, I mean, I know I've said I've just spoken to you, but I've never, ever heard this story. I mean, just the miraculousness of knowing 122 bones. And from what I've seen of you, no one would know you've been through that. Yeah. Like if they just met you now. Yeah. So for you to tell me all this, oh, heart, heart wrenching. I'm, I couldn't, if you'd, if you'd asked me to do this six months ago, I couldn't have done it. No. Not because I couldn't speak about it, it's because I would get too emotional. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like the, the flashbacks and the dreams and the, you know, living with my kids all the time. So, so like I say, I believe that I stopped medication. I come home. I was in the love and the care of me mom and dad, um, which I could never, I know, I know as a parent, I'd do anything for my kids, but like my mom and dad have gone above and beyond. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like they changed their lounge into a bedroom for us. They sacrificed all that time. So when I come home, the only thing I could actually do when I come home because of a bit of self-pride was go to the toilet. Yeah. Everything else they had to do, change me socks, me boxers, me everything. Because I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. So, so like I say, what it is with the motivation of getting to me kids, that was my motivation. So I just started doing exercises every day, leg exercises, ankle exercises. Um, and it hurt. Of course, it hurt. But it to me, the way I would write it off is that pain I was feeling from a physical pain was nothing compared to the mental pain. So it was like no comparison. So I just I ended up adapting and having that ability to really push myself like really pushed myself. Um, they told us I wouldn't walk for a year, like genuinely. I was walking within 10 weeks. Oh my God. Like when I went to the first physio session, they literally only wanted us to walk three steps, four steps. But like say, because I'm a stubborn, stubborn person and I wanted to just hit these goals, I actually done a climbing wall and walked up and down some steps. So the the physio was just like, look, he's clearly not normal. Do you know what it like? And I mean that with a bit of cheek, but, you know, to take the pain, to take the discomfort, but to push myself was, I don't it's it's faith in yourself, isn't yeah. it, really? Yeah. It's, and your mum's so spiritual as well, isn't she? Yeah, yeah. Which so would... when you mentioned earlier. Yes. This is a sort of pattern. So this pattern was actually in the hospital with us. And 
what I find really spooky is that when I was in my coma, and like some of this feels like I'm you'd think I was making it up. I could see this. I could actually see this in my coma. And it was beside my bed. So the nurses and doctors actually put it on the mountain board and put it beside my bed. But when I drew this, I actually drew it for a direction. So it's like to represent a compass. Right. So the other, I'm going to go off the beaten track a little bit. So before right. the accident as well, I was, so as much as I sit and draw. <gasps> Beautiful. This, this is how I've passed me time. And I believe a lot of the stuff I do is very channeled. Yeah, you know, I do. Because I go into a weird state. Um, that first one that you showed us, Colin, when you yeah. say it was in the hospital, did you do it or it was a design that was in the hospital? No, so literally the week before I went in the hospital, I sat and drew it and it was about direction. And like I said earlier, I felt a bit lost. I just felt a bit lost in life. Really? So you were doing those before this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been an artist all my life. So like I say, that... Oh. And it was just to represent the compass. So there's another version of this where I've coloured in the sides. Yeah. So like say just northeast, southwest. Yes. So it was just to represent, like say just direction because I felt lost. So I have to say this, which is another really spooky coincidence. So I have a bit of a weird obsession with Lego. And before the accident, I was building a 3D interactive chess set out of Lego. And I'd done some meditating one night and I got told I had to stop what I was doing and start making Lego legs. So I have made real life working Lego legs. Oh I've spent over 200 hours designing these. There's no plans for them. This is all out my head. So they genuinely work like a real leg. So what I found weird is how I stopped making the chess set and then all of a sudden I randomly made a pair of legs. And then obviously it was my legs that were more severely hurt in the accident. And again, I probably wouldn't say this on, on any other page, but a couple of weeks ago I dropped them and I broke them. But ironically, I was suffering from pain in my legs. And when I rebuilt the plastic legs, the Lego legs, the pain in my real legs went away. So, Honestly, Colin, have, two things just went through my mind then. Have you used visualisation? Have you seen your legs working perfectly through visualisation yeah. or you didn't need to do that? No, just belief that I would walk again. Like, yeah. undenying belief though. Not, I say this about most things in life. Like, if we wanted to attention something or manifest something, yeah, I believe you've got to believe it. Yes, as if it already is. Yeah, so I love that saying by Jordan Spencer, be defined by a, an image of your future, not a memory of your past. So that's one of those little phrases that has always stuck in my head. So I would just imagine myself walking, walking to work. Okay. You know, like, so today, it's a bit of a celebration for us because it's my first day back at work in just, I think, 14 months. And I actually done pretty well, so I was really chuffed. So ironically, it's a bit of a celebration for me today because I've gone back to work today. So I'm I'm really happy. So pleased for you, Colin. Well, I'm, I'm the other thing, when I said two things went through my mind, was the other thing was Joe Spencer's work, or you know, about because it's so in line with how he got himself better, and look where he is now. So you know, there's a reason in all things. Yeah, and I think that's why. I believe in a bit of sort of divine intervention. Like before the accident, I'd, I'd listen to people like Jordan Peterson. Do you know what I mean? Like say Jordan Spencer. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the guy called Lewis Howes. He does um, a podcast uh, and he gets, have you ever heard of the five second rule? I've heard so, of the you ever heard of that, the five second rule? Yeah, but I thought it was if you drop something on the floor, you, if you eat it within five seconds, it's all no, right. It's not. So I can't remember the lady's name. So what it is, it's say right now we're going to make a decision and you've got any doubt to it. If you last more than five seconds thinking about that decision, you'll probably not follow it through. 
So the five second rule is about acting on your impulses. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So if you're going to do it, you'll actually do it within the first five seconds. So that's what I ended up coming up with in my head. Like, say, I had me down days. I had me days where I didn't want to be here. But what I'm really proud of is having good base settings, you know, to to be able to sit in that, I don't call, like call it, but depression, wallow in it, question it, process it, you know, don't become a victim to it. And then I would go five, four, three, two, one, and then I would do whatever. So wow. exercises, like say, just pushing myself and pushing myself and pushing myself. Um, so when I first got out of hospital, I couldn't even hold a pencil. Oh. So of course, like the biggest thing for me was being able to sit and draw because it passes so much time. Do you know what I mean? So, so like say, not even being able to use my hands, I couldn't even hold a cup of tea. So I couldn't even really hold a cup of tea when I come home either. Um, mm -hmm. Drinking out of a straw because obviously my face was still all messed up. Um, Can you believe how good your face looks now? <laughs> like I, I would never know. Yeah, it's so. I'll, I'll quickly, I'll quickly, again without being too gory. So the only thing I didn't break was my pelvis. So I broke everything else. So I've got a very big scar on the back of my head. I've got a big scar running down my back because I broke my neck, my back. Fractured my skull, broke my face, broke my shoulders, cracked my sternum in half, broke all my ribs but two, shattered both my arms, wrists. Um, I've got two metal thighs, I've got two metal knees, I've got a left metal ankle, a metal shin on my left leg. Um, the scarring on my left leg is, you know, it, it has to be seen to be believed really because like say the scarring was just incredible. So I've got about sixty eight, I think, pieces of metal in us. Um, like say it worked out at about one hundred and twenty to one hundred and twenty five breaks and fractures. Um, but can I also just say this as well? I've always been healthy. So believe it or not, I've never eaten a takeaway. <laughs> I've never had a Chinese. I've never had an Indian. I don't eat packet sandwiches. I don't use a microwave. Everything I cook is from scratch, but that has been throughout my entire life. So I think that's another key to this. The nurses and doctors said to my mum and dad, like, if it wasn't for how healthy he was, he wouldn't have survived. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, I yeah, I smoke, but that's the worst thing I do. I don't really drink. I don't do anything else. And like, say, I've always been quite healthy. So that was a massive contributing factor in my recovery is that I'm... I believe I'm quite a clean person. Do you know what I mean? Like Yes, clean living. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think that's made a massive difference. No medication from the NHS, massive self-belief, and just a bloody good diet. So... But you can't take away from the fact then how marvellous the hospital was. Oh, angels in disguise. Angels yeah. in disguise. I think... You know, my I'd always had quite a high opinion of the NHS anyway, because I've been involved in a, you know, I've been a biker all my life, so I've fell off a bike before and do you know what I mean? The normal yeah, accident. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's above and beyond what they do. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like when it comes to something like that, and if you woke up in that state thinking they were trying to kill you, that they had that how difficult that must have been for them to cope with. Like I guess they've seen that before, but not and not as severe. No, not as so. The reason why I, I so I was just saying to you before. So I got involved in what was called a um the Oxford Eye Talk Rehab Study. So. I was one of only about 40 people in the country that got put on this very short list of, because like say, when most people go in a coma, they have no conscious memory of it. You know, and that's, that's what medical records have proved over the years, that when you're in a coma, you really don't remember much. But for every day I was in a coma, I have an individual dream. That's why I believe my body was in hospital, but my soul or the inner part of me had to ascend to survive. Yes. Um, to take you out of that. So another thing 
Oh. I get a, a question I've had a lot is, um, do you see the light? And yes, I did. So... Yeah. I've just completely. <laughs> so three times, like my voice has changed. So three times I saw the light and it was like a test. I had to pass a test each time. So to survive, to fight for me life, to plead for me life, like bargain, negotiate, everything. And I think one of the ones where the I talk couldn't get over it is that I have a very vivid group of dreams, but they've also put that down to the day I died in my operation. So I think I was dying in the physical world. But in the spiritual world, that's where I had to put the fight up. Mm -hmm. So in the spiritual world, I put a fight up, literally, literally fighting, arguing, saying, you're not taking us. You are not taking me. I'm not ready I need to get back to me kids. I need to get back to me family. Um, and then I woke up on the bed, but I'm still bound and gagged, by the way. So in all of this, I'm bound and gagged. And I had to pass, like, say, these tests. Um, and that's, that's probably the most vivid one. That lasted hours. They were doing rituals on us. So in the spiritual world, they were about to do, like, a ritual killing but in the real world, I'm actually dying on an operating table. But I passed the test in the spiritual world, which was what allowed me to come back to this world. So that's where a lot of the PTSD and the... I don't like calling it that. I think it's just more confusion of working out what was real and what wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that was, that was one of the hard... It's not just been about walking and learning to walk this year. I, I died. <laughs> you know what I mean? I died. So it's coming to terms okay. with that from what I've seen, what I've experienced, what I now believe the world is, you know, because I have a slightly different outlook now. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. Oh my God. So, what about your boys? So, yeah, Reese, um, he's going back to work soon. So, the oldest son, he's re. So Jackie, they told him he wouldn't walk for two years. They told him he wouldn't go back to work. But again, me mom, me dad, me, I wrapped him in a cloak of protection, you know, and I've drew it. I've also drew that cloak of protection. I keep that one private because it was just for me and Reese. Do you know yes. what I mean? So I'm happy to show anyone my artwork, but that yes. just felt quite personal to him so I drew his shield of protection and ironically the week after I drew it they then told us he could be released to go home so Gosh. It's, but it's belief I can't, like I think where I've talked to a lot of people in the past and it was early doors what I've what I feel like I've not done is give a point to these talks and my point now was belief You've got to believe in yourself. Yes. The opinion of others, I don't care whether it's friends or family, because they heard one thing, he's not going to survive, he's not going to walk, so they have that own worry. I didn't believe that, not for a second. I didn't believe it. You're not telling me what I'm going to do and what I can't do, do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. So it's just... I don't know, coming from a loving family, I've always been supported, just like, say, that belief. And they can't waver. It can't waver for a second. You have to keep that end goal in your mind's eye all the time. So for me, it was ticking off little things like holding a cup of tea, eating a sandwich, going to the toilet by myself. So I didn't have to, like, you know, because... I'd like to think I'd still hold a bit of pride with the being a bloke and yeah. when your mom's wiping your arse and as a 40-year-old man, it's like pride just goes out the window. <laughs> you know, pride just went. So it was just about, like say, digging deep, forgetting about the little things and setting little achievable goals. So sitting in the garden. So the first day it rained, I sat in the garden with just me boxers on because I never thought I'd feel the rain again. Oh, like God. seriously. So, and my friends were like, "What are you doing?" I was like, "I'm enjoying the feeling, just the cold, the freshness." So I never, I don't take anything for granted. Every no. day, I wake up, 
every day I wake up now, I say thank you. I can't stress that enough. The first words out my mouth every morning are thank you. Mm -hmm. Like, thank you for waking us up. Mm -hmm. So, but like I say, my point is, is just never stop believing. I don't care whether you've been in an accident like me. I've took some bad news off a friend. So my friend's mum the other day got diagnosed with stage four cancer. But she's stubborn and she's, she's not believing that she's got it. And she's defying all the odds because I believe it's belief. So if you believe something in here so much to mm -hmm. the point where you can feel it, taste it, smell mm -hmm. it, You've, that's how much you've got to believe. Because if I believe if I wavered from any of that, I wouldn't be sat here talking to you now, Jackie. Without right? a doubt. Without a doubt. And mentally and physically, you've had to work on both, really. Yeah. Unbelievable. The whole yeah. thing. Yeah, it's been incredible. And what about your other boy? So, yeah, he's actually, bless him, he's moving to Wales in two days. So he's he's found a girlfriend. Um, He's a farmer, so... My youngest son's a farmer, um, qualified farmer. Went to Sparshot College for years. Um, he met a girl a few months ago. He went up to Wales a couple of weeks ago to meet her, and he's been offered a job. They found somewhere to live. So, I told him if he come home, I'd kick his butt because I wanted to just follow his heart. Goose to follow, your gut, follow your heart, like yeah, yeah. You know, I left home when I was eighteen, and I moved to New York. I'd never even been on a plane. Wow. So when I was 18, I moved to New York of all the places. I went and moved to New York and worked on a disabled camp looking after disabled kids. Um Thing, what you would have learned from that, Colin. Uh, time in, but that's what I'm saying. I was I know I might be a car builder, boat builder now, but my predominant line of career was I was a carer for 15 years. So registered social worker, child care manager, and stuff like that. So so yeah, that's that was my other profession. What a but story. again, like when I used to be in care, even when I used to look after the kids, you've you're looking after very traumatic kids and they've been through a hell of a lot of abuse. But and I used I'll use this little girl very quickly. She heard me talking to a member of staff one night about manifesting. Long story short, we were walking to the shop the next day and she's like, Colin, what's manifesting? She's only nine years old, yeah. And I told her in basic terms, what I thought manifesting was. And I said to her, look, pick pick a random object and ask for it. But you don't tell us, don't tell me what it is, but just ask for it. I said, in a couple of days, maybe tell us what it is you wanted, right? So what it was, she asked for a rainbow umbrella. We went out that weekend and she got given a rainbow umbrella by a stranger. So, like I say, the power of thought, the power of manifestation. And what it was is that she couldn't get over it. She, as a nine-year-old, she just got the concept. Um, and what it is, I've just tried to install in her, look, it's belief. If you believe you will get adopted, because obviously the kids I used to look after were taken out of home set situations and often fostered or adopted, yeah, because of home life. Yeah. Um, and I just, and she's like, my dream is to get adopted. And I was like, right, write it down and look at that piece of paper every day and believe it like you'll never, like you don't waver. Jackie, within three weeks, she'd been adopted. No. And it was unheard of in our care setting. I can't stress that enough. Yes. Because the kids we looked after were so vulnerable and at risk, they didn't actually get housed very often because they were so troubled. And she was a troubled little girl, like, you know, had been through a horrific life. But like I say, my point about that was, is just belief, just belief. Oh. So when she believed she would get adopted, honestly, within a month, she got adopted. And she'd been in care for about five years of her life. And no one had even ever looked at them. So I saw I a clip today of a boy um thing that come up um saying that when he got adopted he asked all his kindergarten friends to come along to witness the the signing of the adoption and they all came I mean it's just so amazing when that can happen but belief is like you say but did you have that belief before all this happened like really as strong as yeah oh. yeah um I'm a grafter I've always been a grafter um like I say I so 
I'll I'll quickly say when I started my own business, so Tins of Art was my business. Um, so when I decided to start my business, I was actually working as a boat builder at the time. I was at home with my partner and I said, look, she knew I wasn't having a very good time at work. So again, I'll, I'll nutshell all of this. I was like, I'm going to the shop. I'm grabbing a bottle of wine. I'm going to grab some munchies. So I just went down to Little, And when I was walking around Little that day, I just asked for a sign if I could start my own business. And in my head, when I was walking around Little, I'm thinking, I just need 15 grand, which isn't a lot of money to start the sort of business I needed to do. And I just want a sign. I want a building and I want 15 grand. As I got in the car outside a little, a five pound note blew beneath me feet and in pink writing across the front of the five pound note was 15,000 pound in pink writing. Within 48 hours of me finding that 15, that five pound with the pink 15,000 written on it, that happened on a Thursday, Friday. Within 48 hours, I had 15 grand in my bank and by the Monday, I found my business workshop. So, it's... That is, oh, my God. Honestly, Colin, you've got so much to share. I just believe, like, say, it's, so, like, did you go to Knowlton Church? Was it Knowlton Church? Yeah. Jack? So, when I went to Knowlton Church back in the... That was the first time I'd been out the house. Really? It's the first time I was out the house on my feet. I hurt like hell that day because, obviously, I would... I'd, I'd only been walking about two weeks when I went there. No. And it took us near on 20 minutes just to walk up to the church. Do you well, know I'm the... not surprised. What was that, June? That was June, the June one or September? No, the June one. June, yeah. So that was the first time I left the house. Felt really empowered by everything. So the group meditation, the sound bath they done. I f actually, like, I had limited feeling in my legs at the time, but when they'd done the sound bath and people were drumming around us, it was, I could feel it. Oh. I could genuinely feel it in my legs. And and I don't know if you remember, I actually walked around and I asked a few people because in my meditation, I saw a marching band. And I was also speaking to about half a dozen other people who had the same meditation. And I was just like, whoa. So again, that freaked me out a little bit. But I thought it's weird how it was like a marching band. So when yeah. I walk at the minute, it's like I pretend there's like a marching band. Oh, God. So I try and, like, keep the pace. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's my yeah, pace. Yeah. Setting. yeah. So, but what's the pain threshold? What's the pain like now for you? None. None at all. No, really? I get a little bit of nerve pain in the evenings. That's just where my body's calming down and, you know, shutting down for the evening. It hurts sometimes, but it only lasts a few minutes. But apart from a little bit of nerve pain, touch wood, I've been pain free throughout pretty much most of this with no painkillers no medication and so that's what i say no medication that's what i was gonna say i mean that's amazing that you've managed to do that really and your son that's going to wells did he have many operations like did he have many broken bones or anything ruptured his kidney his spleen broke his ribs broke all his left arm shoulder um, he actually ended up su suffering from survivor's guilt. So where he saw me in the coma and Reese in the coma and he got told that we, I think, honestly, Jackie, we got given like a 10% chance to live. So when he was told that, he obviously thought he was going to lose his brother and his dad. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um, so when we recovered, ironically, Kean, where we were so ill for so long, he ended up suffering from a bit of what you call survivor's guilt, where he physically recovered really quickly, but mentally he was probably the most scarred out of the three of us because he he had the visual, you know, he had the visual of the accident, he had the visual of seeing me in recent hospital. Um, but look, we've all had counselling, we've all had a lot mm. of therapy, um. And again, part of the NHS, like we said earlier, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. For if yeah. it wasn't for that counselling, the guidance, the physio, and just having someone to turn to sometimes. Because obviously, when you're having your really dark days, 
you're not you're not necessarily going to tell the people around you that you love the most because you're scared it's going to hurt them. So having a therapist and someone to actually talk to, being a normal bloke beforehand, I ain't talking to anyone I'm fine, you know what I mean? Like the normal uh, yeah. bloke attitude. But I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the therapy in the aftercare. Do you know what I mean? Like it's it's been second to none, second to none. And your mum was putting pictures and crystals around your bed or something, wasn't she? Yeah. 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 I mean, that's because her belief is so strong and she's just so wonderful. So mum mom got told not to touch us. So again, from the spiritual world, she got told not to actually do any hands-on healing. Oh. But, but she did from a distance. But that belief, my son will wake up. My son, do you know what I mean? Like... So I also have to say that, like, in my flashbacks and in my dreams, random people were coming to my thoughts in my dreams. But I've also later found out that they're the people that really did care. So I'm not saying in this process I found out who my friends are. I found out who cares. It's not who your friends are. It's, it's who's, you know, my friends chipped together and bought us 500 quid's worth of Christmas presents. You know what I mean? Like, but it was all stuff to do with me hands, just bits of Lego trying to, do you know what I mean? So, yes. So, yeah, the, again, mom's belief, mom's unwavering belief, I believe, and the love I've received, the prayers, mm -hmm. I believe is a massive part of the recovery. Again, yeah. if it wasn't for the people around, I couldn't have done this by myself. No way. No, no. way. Oh. So, just to be told to keep going. Paul will love you. You know what I mean? Like, you and you're worth back it. being able to draw now as well yeah. with your hands. Yeah. Like, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Have you I'm met really... Matt Bell yet? No, you're not the first person to mention him, though. So I've been, someone's mentioned him a few times to us. Yeah, I'll make sure you meet him. Yeah. Oh, is that, he the, is, does he do artwork as well? He does artwork and he's very much into sacred geometry and I think he'd just love to see yours, yeah. All right, okay. I think Paul might have mentioned, does he do a podcast or like a, a web with Paul? Yes, he does. I, yeah, they I, do I, the Positive Living Community. Oh, I, I think I've done that weeks ago. So I, I've met him online, but not in person. Oh, okay. Yeah, good, good. He, he probably knows my face, but really? I've never seen seen him face to face or anything. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So obviously, in part part of the Sundays, it's been a massive part of the healing. So like I've done my sacred geometry class, you know, in the group, and I kind of get over, you know, there's people that are still drawn now and have just took it and run with it. It's like I opened, just opened the can of worms for them and they've, they've just took off. So the Sunday mornings, meeting people like you, Jackie, Kaz and Paul, Fiona, like it's been life-changing. It really has. It's when you feel so alone in the world and you feel like you've got no one to turn to, you know, like say apart from my family and, to be able to just turn up at a group as a stranger and within a couple of weeks be really accepted, you know, and then to do the classes and the webinars and the drawings is, it's just blown us away. Like, I, I'm, I couldn't be more thankful, to be honest. Like, I wouldn't be speaking to you if it wasn't for coming, you know what I mean, on a Sunday and stuff. So. Yeah, well, exactly. Um, But, well, that was it. You came to the Psychic Supper and I said to Ellie, oh, my gosh, you know, 122 broken bones. Um, I don't know the story, but I said he's a walking miracle. I know that. Mm. And, um, and yeah, so she said, right, we'll get him on. Hey, like to do this and come straight through to you. But, um, yeah, phenomenal. I didn't know you were doing that morning for the drawing because I would have definitely come. Will you be doing any more? But obviously you've got a job now. Yeah, but I only do a four-day week. So, funny enough, this weekend... Um... A few people that missed it have been bugging us to do it again. Um, so yes, I'll definitely be doing it again. It'll probably be a Friday this time, but apart from the day changing, I'll definitely do it again. Um Jackie, you wanna... will come. When when you're up the hill, I don't know if you know Ian, so Ian and Sue. Yeah, Ian and Sue, yeah. Yeah. 
ask Ian to sh see his pictures. He went from that class just drawing a few lines to literally, he's now drawn stuff like this. Really? He's done amazing, absolutely amazing. It's incredible. I'm that. Yeah, I'm, yeah. They're very but a few into... people have. I think even Jen said she was doodling a bit. And right. Look, I, I believe that. So when I done the class, I'll quickly say this. So you must have heard of the flower of life and stuff like that. Oh, if you look at the flower of life, it gives you strength. Yeah. So the flower of life should actually, I think, should be Nick renamed the blueprint of life. Because from that one image, you can draw every single shape known to man. So if it wasn't for the flower of life, you wouldn't have your sofa, your desk, your fridge, your TV, so your car. And I think we all have that as a blueprint yeah. somewhere in us. And I feel like when I done the class, it was just like I just unlocked a few people. And like I say, they just got it and they've ran with it. And Ian especially is probably like the prize student. He's just took it and ran with it. Um, like he showed me some pictures this weekend and I'm blown away, like genuinely blown away by what he's done in the last six weeks without a doubt. It's been incredible. Excited for your future, Colin. Yeah. So I've like say I've just started work today and I feel like I've never been away. I've already been offered another job. I've been offered to go to Greece straight away. So really? Yeah, because I'm I'm good at what I do. Like, say, I'm, I spent years hiding behind that, never really believing in myself. But, like, say, I, I am good at what I do. And it's got us my job. I didn't even have an interview. I just rocked up, chatted to the guy. He's like, you start Monday. Oh, my <laughs> it, it God, wasn't even, Colin. It wasn't even an interview. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty chuffed. I wouldn't, if you said to me six months ago, Carl, you're going to be online talking to people, you're going to have a new job, the boys are going to be fine, I would have never believed you, I don't think. Do you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, yeah because of where you were at that time. But, yeah. I mean, as you've gone forward, what you've learned from this, what you've learned about yourself, no, what you can pass on to others, it's amazing. Yeah. So grateful you took the time to speak with me. No, no, thank you. And I feel like when I was in hospital and I had some volunteers come and sit with us, I think I realised then I want to help people. Mm -hmm. You know, so some of the volunteers were coming into hospital and they're not getting paid for it. They would sit with us for a few hours, listen to us cry, listen to us shout, listen to us just offload. And I think I decided there and then I thought I really want to start helping people but in sort of my little way, do you know what I mean? With my drawing, with what I can bring, I suppose, or my creativity. So, and it's with it's, your belief, yeah, yeah, with your belief, yeah. yeah. Oh so, even when goodness. I done me drawing more, and I quickly did a quick talk, and there's people sat there with tears, and I'm like, Whoa, I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that. No, I. I didn't know it was going to be like that. But, of course, when you think of it logically, if you've had 122 broken bones, there had to be a big story that went with that. And, my goodness, there was. Wow. Thank I think the ironic thing is as well, I'll just say this. Yeah, yeah. If we'd gone 10 foot to the left or 10 foot to the right, we would have walked away and ended up in the field. We hit the only tree along that road, yeah. the only big tree. So it's... It's weird. I mean, you've and... got to question that as well. There must, you know, that if you believe there's always a reason in everything, but gosh. And I have to also as well, like what I was saying when I come out of my coma, which I didn't, I didn't believe them to start off with, but I get it now is I kept saying we were pushed. It felt like the car was pushed. Really? So like when you see the video, I, I can't, in real time, it's like it's in slow motion. I can't stress that enough. Like, we're just driving down the straight bit of road and the car just does that. And then all of a sudden, we just start spinning at just over 40 mile an hour. Like, say, 41, 42 mile an hour. And what the reason why, obviously, we had so much injuries is because the gap between the car losing control and hitting the tree was only about 30 feet. So that's less than the length of a truck. So it's the deceleration that causes the damage. 
Yes. Yeah. So yes. that's what caused the damage, really. So the whiplash, everything that broke up here was was basically a result of the deceleration. So, but like I've always believed I was pushed. And when you see the video, like the first time I seen the video, I just burst into tears. Yeah. Because it, you question everything. I questioned what I was doing. Was it me? Was it a distraction? Was it me driving? So when I saw the video, it was just relief that it wasn't me. It wasn't me driving. You literally see a huge big splash of water, like say cartoons. And the way we hit the trees, and I thought even my solicitor, when I went to court, is like, she's like, I don't get what I'm looking at. It, it, the result didn't, the outcome didn't fit the, I'm not saying the crime, but it didn't fit the crash. Yes. You know what I mean? We crashed a four yard mile an hour and to suffer that many broken bones. Yes. It's like, say, it's, it's like we were pushed. <laughs> why? Yeah. You Then you'd want to, why? I figured all that out, but that's a whole other story in itself. Well, come back then. Come back when you feel you can share that, because that's really interesting. And I have to say, Jackie, that happened on a Wednesday morning with everyone at the group. It happened, I did, so Jen was doing some dowsing and another lady said something. And you know, I don't know if, I don't know about you or other people, but like people might say the odd sentence or phrase or word to you and sometimes it just resonates. Like, you know, you get the goosebumps, you feel all funny. Someone said something in this group one day, it didn't just resonate, it leveled me. Like I started crying instantly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then all the way home, I was crying and, like, say, I, f I have figured out what I think it was. But again, if you're not a spiritual person or believe in this sort of thing, I'd, I think you'd think I was just... Honestly, I'm open to most things. Yeah. So I actually think it was an old history, my old past. Oh. Goose, that's the truth. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, if you goose it, some at you here. That's the truth. Yeah. Just heard. Oh, well, that's interesting. That's interesting. And it's not just top, completely head to toe. Yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. gosh, and again, yeah. No, that. Oh, that's interesting. Really interesting. Yeah. Oh, Colin, my gosh. Um, if anyone wanted to contact you for any reason, are you happy for them too or not? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. What's the yeah. best way? Your email. Just email, you can post my email, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. Like I say, I speak to the NHS quite often. I think I've got another call with them next week. I do group therapy with people um down at Anchor House in Totten. So I am used to talking about it now. I do realise, like I say, and I realised early doors that it was gonna help people in other aspects, you know what I mean? So it's it's massively helped. Um, you know, and I go to this brain injury clinic with my son. So he's a motivation to people because, yes. like I say, they took, they, I can't stress it enough. They said, you'll never walk. You won't eat properly. You'll not work again. Like, again, they didn't know us. They didn't know the power of that belief and the love we had for each other. And Reese has literally just been for a job interview this week. And he's going to go back to work himself. And it's way ahead of what they ever expected. Like, way ahead. So, yeah, I'm used to doing talks i've realized that we have provided a bit of motivation and and so soon like so yeah. soon i mean it's only a year yeah so the anniversary was last wednesday unbelievable just last wednesday well people are listening to this because the majority that will listen to this i believe will be healers they'll be sending you love and reese and what's your other boy's name kian kian Ian, what a lovely name. Yeah, both. Um, sending you all love and healing. Just, yeah, in oh, Thank you. I really appreciate it. I really Honestly, do. but yeah, what an inspiration thank you, you are. Really. Thank you so much for sharing this today, Colin. I see you're very welcome anytime. <laughs> and I'll see you very soon, I'm sure. Well, I'll hopefully see you on Sunday if you're there. Well, no, I'm going to that workshop in, in Minstead on Sunday. Um, oh, I'll see you. I'm sure I'll see you soon. I will. Yeah, yeah, you know I'm normally there. Yeah. Okay.
Lots of love. Thank you. Well, and to you, darling. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank thanks. you. Thanks, Bye. anyone watching.